And uh, hello to everybody tonight. My name is Biff Crane, K4LAW. I have uh, been an amateur radio operator since 1969, uh, but I'm only 35 years old. I don't know how that worked, but uh, in any event, tonight we want to talk about um, some things that are important concepts to get us where we need to go as new hams and younger hams, and even some information for some older hams tonight. Got a lot of stuff to uh, see if we can get done tonight. Uh, we wanted to talk first about knowledge. Where do you get knowledge? Then where do you get experience? And where can you find equipment? Those are all three things that are interesting and should be uh, discussed for everybody's edification. Now that we've got knowledge, you'll get some book learning. Everybody here on this uh, Zoom call has passed an amateur radio license test. So obviously you all are familiar with license manuals. Also, there is a great volume uh, it's published by the ARRL. That's an amateur radio handbook. The amateur radio handbook has a collection of articles about amateur radio topics that every amateur needs to have access to to understand the workings of RF, the workings of antennas, the working of transceivers, etc. So the ARRL handbook is a very good publication, as is ARRL publications in general. Uh, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of publications that the League uh, has. And we will go to their, their information page. Let's see if I can do this right. I worked in rehearsal. What the hell am I doing there? Um, okay. I hope you all see that. I trust you all see that. Uh, this is the front page of the Amateur Radio Relay League web page. They have a lot of interesting information, uh, interesting topics for you to look at that are the latest news. They have ads, of course, over here. And they have a whole uh, library of books that are of interest to amateur radio operators. Now, these books, Many of them are in our library at the amateur at the Tampa Amateur Radio Club. Many of them can be checked out. Some of the reference books cannot, but uh, in any event, we'll talk a little bit about the ARRL. Uh, you have uh, repeater directories, which are not as important as they used to be because there's a uh, app for that, as they say. Uh, but there's all sorts of stuff you can get. There's the handbook we were talking about, the ARRL handbook. And it can be a six volume set if you order it that way or hardbound. So it's, uh, it's got a lot of good information in it. And uh, this is the, uh, the, the one volume here with a lot of stuff in it. And there's uh, a lot of stuff that they have including Morse code contests and basic electronics. So there is a, a wealth of information that are, is easily obtainable from the ARL website itself. Now the ARL has a membership dues of $49 a year. And what do you get for $49 a year? You get uh, the QST. Uh, the QST is the Q signal for calling all amateurs. And QST Magazine is something that uh, you get each month in your mailbox. Uh, the QST Magazine has equipment reviews. It has information on contests that have been worked, on DX that has been worked, on high band UHF, VHF stations that have conducted tests across the Atlantic and things like that. The expeditions, there's a whole bunch of things in there, but let me call your attention to another thing. On the air is the On the Air magazine, which you also have the 
uh, subscription to automatically by being a member of ARRL. This is a great magazine. ARRL has finally put a magazine that uh, is really aimed at uh, not necessarily a beginner ham, but a less than seasoned ham. Let's put it that way. Uh, it goes over some really good information, helps you with questions about getting on the air. And uh, I would commend all of you, especially the newer operators that are on the Zoom call tonight, to look at that publication uh, if you do join the league. Like I said, it is with your membership. Uh, so that is an excellent, excellent uh, uh, magazine that you can view. You can also view the QST online as well, but they send you a hard copy of that. And a great thing about QST also is that it has ads for the latest equipment from the latest vendors in the back end of the magazine. That's why I usually read my QST backwards. I go to the end and work my way back into the uh, other uh, articles that are in the, in the QST. But On the Air magazine has only been on the air, or it's only been active, and it's only published every two months, I believe, but it's only been out for about a year and uh, a little bit more than a year. And uh, I met the, uh, the woman who is the editor of it and uh, really, really has got, uh, got the magazine off on a good foot. And it has a lot of good information, a lot of good stuff for you. Where else can you get knowledge? Uh, there are other interest magazines that are DXing based, that are contest based, and they all flow through the ARRL and all are generally free or a small upcharge if you want uh, an actual magazine in hand. Uh, those things are like the Tech Journal, which is called QEX, and the Contest Journal. So that's, that's a great resource. Uh, the ARRL is, uh, is, is absolutely uh, amazing at what they do. Uh, they're the only advocate group that we have and so that is something that you have in front of you all of the time for the use. And uh, like I said, we have over 200 volumes at the clubhouse in our library. And uh, please feel free, if you're a member, to uh, check out uh, multiple volumes to uh, study up on something. Now you can also get a lot of information just from the club itself. Uh, there's a lot of information that you can find on the internet reflectors. The club reflector is full of information from time to time about various aspects of the club operation, as well as some other topics that are aired sometimes. And you'll also be able to find if you have a particular radio that there's like a uh, an ICOM 7300 interest group that you can go sign up for and you get all of that information. Uh, similarly, there's a Collins interest group. There is all sorts of information available that goes back and forth on, uh, on antennas and, and tower installations on uh, an interest group called Tower Talk, which is a great reflector for those people that are looking at designing, building, putting up towers, doing whatever it is for antennas. But uh, that, that is uh, just, there's enormous amount of stuff out there. Now, also our TARC talks every month have been good topics. Uh, next month, we're gonna be talking about satellite communication. And uh, this is amateur radio satellite communication. So that will be, a very good program in April. So let's talk about experience. Am I still sharing okay? Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, experience, where you get experience, most importantly, is on the air. You get 
that experience by getting on the air, talking to people, seeing how your antenna performs and uh, getting more prolific in terms of your ability to communicate. Uh, participation in local clubs. That's where you can get some good experience. Participation in events like field day. Uh, we usually have anywhere from 40 to 50 people uh, whenever we did field day the old way, which will probably not be until 2022. But whenever we do field day, you get the true experience of deploying a antenna, a tower, radio, emergency power, and then operating all of that in a 24 hour contest to see basically who can make the most contacts in the most places. So that's a great, great way to get experience as well. Also, ham radio operators have a tradition called Elmering. Uh, an Elmer is someone who is a ham who has experience, who is sharing that experience with another ham and helping that ham enjoy the hobby more. Uh, we have an Elmer program at the club. If you'd like to be assigned an Elmer, we have uh, several Elmers who are willing and able, very able, to help you out in particular areas that you may be interested in and get you to where you want to be to maximize your participation in the hobby. Uh, it's really a, a good hobby. Uh, there's a lot of decisions that you're going to have to make about uh, getting in the hobby and what you're going to do in the hobby. Uh, there are some simple ones like uh, dictated by your licenses to what frequencies you can be on and what modes you can operate. But there's other more nuanced uh, questions that you have to face like, do I have uh, the ability to put out an outdoor antenna? Can I get on HF from my residence? or do I have to do it remotely? Uh, what, are, what are the antenna restrictions? Antenna restrictions are very, uh, very widespread in Florida. If you live in, a, in any type of subdivision that was uh, subdivided any time after the 80s, you more than likely have homeowners associations and those homeowners associations most likely have rules against amateur radio antennas. Now, that is, you know, that is the bad news. The good news is, is that you can find areas that don't have those restrictions, that you can live in peace and harmony with your homeowners association or areas that don't even have a homeowners association. Uh, owners, homeowners association. Uh, Hillsborough County exempts uh, amateur radio antennas from regulation. So if you live in the county portion of Hillsborough County and you don't live in a homeowners association, you can pretty much uh, put up what you want uh, up to about 200 feet and then you have to get the FAA involved. So there is uh, a lot of decisions that you have to make uh, about where you're gonna live, how you're gonna live and what, how you're gonna be able to participate in the hobby. Simple things once you get in the hobby, do I keep a log book? Uh, a log book is something that is just as it says, it's, it's a log of your contacts. It's no longer a mandatory requirement by the FCC, but it is a record of each person that you've talked to over time. And you simply make note of the time of the contact, the signal strength, of the contact, the actual frequency that it was on, and then you can put name and, and uh, QTH or, or location or and whatever else you want to add to it. There are some simple logging programs out there. There are some that are freeware. There are some that are relatively inexpensive that are very complex that uh, a lot of guys at the club use. Uh, uh, N3FJP is a, a a log program that's very popular. Uh, Ham Radio Deluxe is a program that has uh, gone from freeware 
to a licensed product. There's an annual licensing fee now with that. So you're able to uh, annually get updates. You can get pretty good, uh, pretty good service whenever you run into a problem with uh, the program. Uh, the, the consumer service uh, is, is pretty good. Uh, the guys that they have that do it uh, are scattered around the country and they do a very good job of getting back to you relatively timely if you are a subscriber to their product. Now, Ham Radio Deluxe is actually uh, located, uh, if you will, in Brandon uh, or, or Riverview, I think it is. So that's a Hillsborough County homegrown product and it has been around for more than a decade now. So uh, there are licensing fees involved, but it's, it's a very feature rich program that allows you to do all manner of uh, modes that are the digital modes other than FT8 and FT4 and some of those WSJT modes that uh, we talked about last month. So, but if you're into uh, radio teletype, PSK 31, PSK 64, PSK 132 or 128. Uh, you're you're covered with all of those. If you want to do slow scan TV, they've got a module for slow scan TV. If you want to do satellites, they've got a pretty good satellite program that uh, not a lot of people use, but uh, uh, it is very usable and it has a lot of good predictions and good predicting uh, of paths for uh, any types of the satellites or the ISS that are going overhead. And again, if you're interested at all in digital satellites, we will have a great program in April regarding uh, digital satellites. Uh, in addition to QSLing, uh, you, there is something now called Logbook of the World. This is something that the ARRL put together a few years ago. And you don't actually have to be a member of the ARRL to use Logbook of the World. You simply get a Logbook of the World account. And what you do is you periodically dump your log and all the contacts in your log. And if the people that have worked you do the same thing and the information checks out, then that's going to be a confirmed contact. So if you're into putting paper on the wall, like DXCC certificates, uh, indicating that you've worked 100 countries or any of the endorsements thereof, uh, you, you really need to maintain a logbook. So uh, the earlier you start with that, the better off uh, you're going to be. Uh, I, I know whenever I got back into ham radio in 1995, I had been away for a while. And uh, when I started, we didn't have computers. So and I found a computer logging program uh, that was called Hose Nose and uh, a program from a guy out of Atlanta. And I started uh, logging when I got back on the air. And I'm very thankful that I did now because I have uh, all my records going back to 1995 of who I talked to, when I talked to them, where they were, what kind of signal they gave me, all sorts of stuff like that, all sorts of good information. Uh, QSLing, again, you can do it by logbook of the world or you can do the old fashioned uh, postcard routine. And you can either do it directly or you can do it through, uh, if you are a member of the ARRL, you can use the ARRL incoming and outgoing bureau service. Now, the, the bureau is simply uh, a place where cards are sent from all over the world to a four area, if that's your call sign, uh, bureau. And they're put in little bags and they're shipped to you from time to time. Uh, you put money on deposit at the bureau and they provide the envelopes and the postage. They sort through the QSLs, and when you get a you get a little six by uh, six by nine envelope from the bureau, it's a happy day. 
because you get a bunch of cards from people that you usually worked about a year and a half to two years ago. And uh, they're from all over the world and they're, they're really, uh, really great. Uh, and whenever the incoming bureau uh, delivers, it's, it's a wonderful thing. Similarly, if you talk to a lot of people around the world, and you have to or want to send them hard printed QSL cards, you can use the outgoing bureau. And the outgoing bureau, what they do with the outgoing bureau is they basically sort them and send them to other countries. And they take them and put them in their envelopes and uh, ultimately get to them in uh, about a year, year and a half, somewhere in there. And the, the biggest advantage of that service, and it is a service, the biggest advantage of that service is that you can take a stack of uh, 100 cards and you pay by weight. You don't pay by the individual card like you would be if you were mailing individual cards. You pay a per pound or per ounce uh, charge for the outgoing bureau. You just put them all in order, wrap them up, send them up to Newington, they do the rest. So that's that's a really good advantage too. But all that's predicated on finding a logbook program that you might like and deciding to keep logs. Now, most people I know do not log uh, contacts that are on repeaters because they don't really count for anything other than just names in a, in a log entry that you would know if you ran into them again. So, the repeaters are, are the ones doing the hard work. Those, those contacts really aren't going to count for anything and any, uh, any awards or anything like that. But most people do log sideband VHF contacts and UHF contacts and CW, as well as uh, FT8. And the beauty about FT8 is it generates the log for you. The, the FT8 program itself actually does do that. And there is FT8 on two meters, on 70 centimeters, on 1.2 gig, even 900 megahertz, they've got uh, FT8 going on. Uh, check around 144.174 on Monday night, which is tonight, around uh, 8.30, and you'll start hearing on 140, uh, 144.174, You'll hear FT8 sound, uh, sounds. So all of that is decisions you have to make to make your ham radio experience as much fun as you possibly can. So we've talked about that a little bit. Let's talk about some really fun stuff. Let's talk about equipment. Now, uh, equipment is is what you, what you want it to be. Uh, you have to make a lot of decisions about uh, what bands you want to work, what modes you want to work, what the form factor of the of the radio is that you want in your in, in your shack. Uh, can you can you have a shack with unlimited space where you can have big radios, or do you need to have a radio like a ICOM 7100 that is sits on a desk about a uh, five by three square rectangle or five by three rectangle? and the rest can go under the desk or wherever. Uh, what, what space do you have? What do you want to do? How do you want to do it? Uh, but before we get too much talking about the, the, the inside box, I gotta talk about antennas. Antennas are uh, the, the most important thing uh, about your installation. It's it's the, it's the first it's the first and most important part of your installation. Uh, the second is your antenna. The third is your antenna. Antennas are the name of the game in radio. You can have a twenty thousand dollar radio and a crappy antenna, and you ain't gonna get out worth a damn. You can have a really good antenna system, and you can have a little crappy handheld or a little crappy uh, homebrew crystal set or a little five watt radio. And if you've got a good antenna, that will play for you. And that will, that will be where you want to focus uh, as much of your energy and your resources as you can in getting that right. 
and there we all have restrictions about that. Uh, you know, some have uh, neighbors and spouses that don't like towers. Some have HOAs that don't let you have towers. Some have local governments that limit the size of your towers, but local governments cannot prohibit you from having a tower. Um, so that they, they can only pro they can only regulate the size and location. Now, <clears throat> the 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 space that you have for an antenna is really important because, um, generally speaking, as you go lower in frequency, generally speaking, your antenna is going to grow. An effective good antenna is going to be larger the lower your frequency, and that's because of that little formula that you learned uh, back when you were studying your technician test about how you determine, uh, you know. This, the length of a quarter wave dipole. And there are some great antennas that are made. There are some great antennas you can make. Uh, there is a, uh, a great ARL manual called the Antenna Book. It's, uh, we have, uh, I think we have one or more in uh, our reference section at the club. Uh, you can check out various antenna designs and determine what's best for you and your location. If you live on uh, in a subdivision on a lot with no trees, you have to have metal trees. <laughs> so you have to figure out how you're going to get the antenna up. And then you're going to have to figure out how you can best use that antenna. Now, there are some other things about equipment that I want to, to talk about before we get off to our uh, question and, and answer period. Uh, first, let's talk about the uh, equipment acquisition. What you see up on the screen now, I hope, uh, is a, a, a list of websites that the Birmingham Amateur Radio Club put together. And this was a number of years ago. And uh, you can see their, uh, their website, w4cue.com. Uh, and this is the Amateur Radio Internet Vendor Directory. Now, this is not updated frequently. So some of these places that you click on, like AES, you'll get something like this. Yeah, and they're not there anymore. So that is, uh, you know, one reservation that you have about uh, this particular uh, ser service that they have there. I'm trying to go backwards here and I can't do it. Let's just go out, come back in. Uh, so you've got... Um, Here we go. Uh, that didn't do what I wanted it to do. Anyhow, you, you can go and you can secure that and you'll have those locations. And I do need to get that back up because I was going to go to some of the websites. But let me, while we're here, let me talk about some other uh, places that you can get used equipment. Uh, my favorite, qth.com. This is a service that is free. It's run by KA9FOX. And uh, those of you who do a lot of FT8 probably have talked to uh, Scott Nieder. Well, your computer has probably talked to Scott's computer more accurately. But uh, KA9FOX has this service that's been going on for quite a while. And what this is is a basic area that you can post equipment that you have for sale or things that you want to buy or things that you want to trade or announcements and things like that. So let's say, for instance, you want to find, uh, you want to buy an ICOM 7300. You search on, let's see, just 7300 will get us there.
So you, you have these search, you've searched, you've found 28 ads that have looking someone looking for a IC7300. So you have people who want to trade for them. Let's see, there's one down here for, yeah, the headset. Here's a guy who wants to trade an SG for a 7300. Here's a guy who wants to buy a 7300. Let's, let's find one for sale. Let's find one for sale. Okay, here we go. Most, uh, most of these sites have pictures. Pictures can be enlarged, so you can actually do some inspection of the radio, uh, albeit just the pictures that you have that are posted. You can always ask for more pictures, but you have the ability to get this. This is uh, at $900, and that's not a really good deal because they're only selling right now for around 1000 but you can always uh, dicker back and forth in terms of getting what there is uh, in, in terms of a value. Uh, but you, you've you got uh, a wide variety of information here where you can search by category. And this will, this will put up all of the information here by category. Uh, and you can also do it individually. But uh, Usually, there's anywhere from 200 to 300 ads placed every day. Some of them are repetitive, some of them are not. So if you're like me and a really weird guy, you read them all. <laughs> it only takes, you know, I usually do it my, you know, right before bed, read them all, see if there's anything out there I just can't live without. And they're sorted with the last, the last one in, first one out. So what you're looking at here is a an ad that was just listed uh, probably within the last 30 minutes or less. And so you can just find a bunch of stuff. Or if you have a want, you can place a want. Or if you want to search on something like, um, uh, let's see, a, uh, well, let's, let's do a, uh, da, 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 da. Let's do a bench or BY1. Yeah, that's always good for laughs. Uh, guy's got paddles. He wants 120. He sold uh, those two for 120. Um, a bench or BY1, iambic paddle, uh, $110, which that guy should be in jail for robbery. Uh, $115. Man, I ought to sell mine. Uh, so you have that. Also, they have ads. And you can view all the banners. They have these banner ads that go along. Like, here's one for r &L Electronics. You can check on that to see what their daily special is. And there's their daily special. But you can also uh, look at all of the banners at one time. Where did it go? And that would give you uh, an idea of across the board who's advertising. Now, the last last thing I'll talk about because I'm running into question time is QRZ.com. What is that? QRZ.com is a service that you can go and you can look up call signs. And it tells you everything you need to know about that person who has that call sign. So if we look up KM4LEW, there is Larry, there's Larry Shack, there's some of Larry's awards, there's his bio. You can get very specific with it and get detail. You can find out that from his house to my house is a bearing of 24.8 in case I want to aim a horizontal beam at him. Uh, you can even see his house. And you know, there it is. Apparently, you live at the Costco wholesale, and that gives you uh, a a way of looking at where you're uh, where you're actually talking, as well as getting the angle right on your rotor to make sure you're pointed in the right direction for those who have the antennas that are directional. 
And that's a, that's a, a really good uh, service. There's various levels of information that you can get. As a member, you can get pretty much all the information you need, uh, but you have to pay uh, a little bit of money for it. It's not too bad, but you, when you have, I would encourage everybody to go to their QRZ page and do things like put pictures there. Here's Larry's shack, or at least how it used to look. I don't know how it looks now, but there's his shack. And there is a lot of information that you can get about that. You can find out what class of license and all that information, everything right there on qrz.com. And that's a, that's a very good service as well. But hopefully uh, you all have an idea of the vast amount of information and resources that are out there. Uh, hopefully you, you, you know that you don't have to pay retail for amateur radio equipment. Ham fests are great. Also, you see on reflectors a lot of times uh, people when they have equipment they're trying to sell and uh, we haven't had a lot of ham fests in a while, they'll put them out on a reflector and that's another way to do it. Also on the air, there are numerous traders nets that can be uh, places where you can go and listen on the air to people listing their equipment. I promised uh, 15 minutes of uh, question and answer uh, I'm really, really pretty much uh, the only, only one, one last thing let me say about retail purchasing of amateur radio equipment. Most of the current live businesses that sell new amateur radio equipment will not charge you sales tax because they do not have a corporate presence in Florida. Companies like Gigaparts, HRO, Main Trading Company, DX Engineering, uh, they generally will match prices. They generally do not charge shipping over $100. And they generally do not charge sales tax unless you're having it delivered someplace or you buy it from them in their front door. Like if you go to Huntsville and you walk into Gigaparts, you're going to pay sales tax in Alabama. But if you have them ship it to you, then you can avoid that sales tax. And you know, at 8%, that, that is a pretty quick. Uh, like if you if you go to like the Orlando Ham Fest next year and you go to the HRO booth and you buy an $800 radio, you can tell them just to ship it to you and they'll ship it out on Monday. You'll have it by Wednesday. But if you want it right then and there and take it with you, you're going to pay another $64 of sales tax on that radio. So... And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's why a lot of, uh, a lot of people prefer to, to, to buy uh, used radios because you don't have sales tax. And a lot of times you can negotiate shipping and a lot of times the prices are very competitive. So um, I will stop there and I will ask if there are any questions that we can uh, discuss the answer to. And please don't forget to unmute yourself if uh, you have any questions. Anyone got questions for Biff? This would be a great time to speak up. I am glad to see a bunch of uh, newer hams here tonight in the audience. So that's that's very good. Biff, there's a question for the new hams in particular. How are the um, the uh, some of the low priced uh, handy targets like the Baofengs? Um, I'm glad you brought that up because it's it was in my notes, but I I, I didn't quite get to it. Um, yes, you can order radios from Amazon, but only certain radios uh, are economical to uh, order from Amazon. The, the, the more traditional manufacturers are, uh, the prices are much, much crazier on Amazon. But for a lot of stuff like Baofengs, uh, 
you can get a Baofeng on Amazon for like $25, $30. Uh, I've gotten several of them. Now, I will say this about that. They're, they're, Baofengs are okay as a first radio. They have problems. Uh, one of the biggest problems is, is the receiver doesn't receive all that well. So you could be in a location where you can transmit into the repeater yet not hear the repeater respond. I found that out uh, in my experience using uh, Baofeng UV-82s as mobile rigs. And they were great. Uh, and, you know, if, if the, the worst thing that would happen if somebody was to break in to your car with the Baofeng in there is that you probably come back and you find that they left you two of them. But the, uh, the Baofeng is a, a great first radio. It can be programmed with a little difficulty. Uh, it's virtually impossible to program by hand. Uh, it, it's just uh, uh, very, very difficult to program by hand. But uh, if you use a pr computer program called Chirp and you get an FTDI chipped uh, USB cable that connects it to your computer, uh, you can generally find that you're being able to connect up quite well and get it programmed quite well. But again, everything has its downside. Uh, they're, they're fairly rugged and they're pretty good. But if you looked at them on a spectrum analyzer, you'd see a lot of spurious emissions and the receive sections is not that good. So it's, it's a good first radio because you know, you, you're into the hobby now, you spent 14 bucks on a license and you spent 25 bucks on a radio. And, you know, now you're ready to start spending a lot more money and know that you, you like it and you enjoy the hobby. I would not go out there and buy a bunch of Chinese radios unless they were better Chinese radios. And there are some out there that are better Chinese radios. But uh, as far as the uh, uh, getting a $25 handheld off of Amazon, no problem with that. They work, but uh, your signal's not going to be as pure and your receiver's not going to be as good. Uh, and, you know, I, 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 can, I can prove that if anybody wants to take a ride with me. I'd, I'd be glad to show you how the same antenna works better on an ICOM handheld than it does on a bow phone. All right, there's a couple of questions. Uh on the uh, chat. Uh, first one is, can you talk about more about Hillsborough County exemptions for HOA rules on antennas? There's no exemption for HOA rules. HOA rules are contracts that you have made with uh, the homeowners association that you will or won't do something. Uh, so that does not affect that. There is uh, a, uh, an ex by exemption, what it is, is that the, the definition, it is excluded from the definition of, of radio towers. So in Hillsborough County, um, an amateur radio installation is not regulated in the same fashion that other radio towers are. And I, and, and that's, that is uh, also, there is uh, a, a, FCC division, uh, decision called PRB1 that basically prohibits a local government from precluding amateur radio. So uh, the city of Tampa has regulations that you can't exceed 45 foot in height and you can only have one antenna and it must be located in the backyard. Now, how they count one antennas, a lot of times the guys, when they're inspecting, count the tower. And if you have five antennas hanging off of it, a guy just counts it as one. But the, the bottom line of it is Hillsborough County doesn't have similar regulations. So uh, if, you're, if you're looking to enjoy your hobby and uh, you, you want to get serious about the hobby and start putting down uh, towers, 
then uh, Hillsborough County is the place to be outside of the limits of an HOA. Uh, Biff, one of our uh, uh, participants uh, would like to, uh, more information on how they request an Elmer. They have a lot of equipment, but confused on how to put all the pieces together. <laughs> well, um, it was a lot easier whenever we were meeting regularly in the clubhouse because you could have just gone in and shrugged your shoulders and said, huh? But uh, if you would uh, just send, uh, send an email to member services at hamclub.org. That's member services at hamclub.org and explain that you would like to uh, have an Elmer to help you do X and we will match you up with an appropriate Elmer who will be able to uh, help you in whatever that interest is that you have. Uh, it's really pretty simple, not, not hard to do at all. And uh, we'll be glad to get you hooked up. And uh, you know, we're kind of, kind of uh, in a good position now because uh, uh, all the old guys have been vaccinated. So we're not afraid to leave the house anymore. So <laughs> just uh, send a request for an Elmer to member services at hamclub.org and we'll get you one. Uh, any suggestions, Biff, on a good antenna to install in the attic for HF? Um, it depends on how much space you have between the ceiling and the pitch of your roof. Uh, I know people who have rotatable beams in their roof. It all depends on the space that you have. Uh, certainly, you can uh, put wires up there. You, know, you can put an off-center fed dipole like a G5 RV, a Carolina Wyndham. It's probably not going to cover all the way down to 160 or 80, but it's probably going to get you at least to 20 and probably to 40 in terms of the overall length, depending on how your, how your house is designed and how much straight space you have up in the distance between uh, the, the bottom of the truss and the pitch of the roof to work with. But it, it can be done. It is being done. Uh, there's a fellow down in Sun City Center. Uh, actually, I think he's in Kings Point or down there somewhere. Uh, and he has done uh, several installations of several antennas in his, uh, in his roof. Uh, in the crawl space between the the uh, ceiling and the uh, pitch of the roof. So there uh, certainly anybody looking at ideas can get in touch with him and I have to dig back and get his name, but um, he, he's had a lot of experience with that. There's also publications that the ARRL have on stealth antennas. Some of the ones you can put outside like flagpole antennas and uh, some uh, you can actually do uh, some beverage antennas along fence lines, uh, random length wire, those types of things. We have several uh, uh, people that I've heard on the repeater that have actually helped other members design antennas for their fences. I even uh, know one person who used his gutters as part of his antenna and it worked fairly well with an antenna tuner eh, you know everything is free game i mean uh, if you've got a good solid uh, big big honking antenna tuner that will tune uh, a very very bad load down to 52 ohms uh, you can tune up just about anything All right. Any other questions uh, for Biff? And you can get a hold of Biff uh, again uh, just by uh, sending an email to member of services at hamclub.org. Um, and you will probably also hear him quite a bit on the uh, TARC repeater on the 105. So, and I'm sure anytime that he's on there, he'll be more than happy to talk to you and answer any questions you might have as well. Um, Biff, thank you so much, sir, for being part of our group tonight. 
your presentation was awesome. Uh, let me just add that uh, we have recorded this presentation. And so it will be available soon on our hamclub.org uh, website. And uh, usually uh, uh, Dan will send out an email here in a few days to let us know when that's available. Also, if you are interested, uh, visit the hamclub.org website. There is a tab where you can look at past Tark Talks that we have done. We have done some on, uh, some on satellites, moon bounce, uh, quite a few different subjects, uh, and how to select a microphone and set up your microphone. Uh, so uh, check out that the website, and there's a lot of great information on there uh, for you. And as Biff uh, already has announced, next uh, month we will be talking about satellites. And this will be directed strictly to the ICOM 9700 that we have at the club. And we do have a satellite station there. And uh, Mike will be presenting his Tark Talks around our operation there at the club, uh, which hopefully available will, will be available very soon, uh, where you can go there and operate satellites. Um, uh, Dan, do you have anything else? No, just a uh, reminder, if you haven't renewed or if you'd like to join, you can send a check, uh, the address on the website or easiest ways to renew online at hamclub.org. We're coming up to our new dues year, starting in April, it's only 35 bucks a year. All right, thank you. And just a reminder that, uh, just a, a, a note, that you may be getting some emails from us about renewing. Uh, if you've already renewed, just disregard. We thank you for it, and uh, and thank you. But uh, we are continuing to set out reminder emails, so you still might be able to uh, might be getting some of those emails. Again, uh, Biff, thank you so much. Any other questions or any other announcements before we close our talk talks tonight? I did want to mention uh, that we have the Tarknet tomorrow night at eight o'clock, as we do on every Tuesday night. Uh, please uh, join in. I see a lot of folks that have uh, have been on the net recently. And Dan and Don, I see y'all in there. And uh, everybody uh, certainly welcome on that. Uh, we have the virus net uh, will be uh, next Monday. And we will have a special virus net on the fifth Monday of the month with a special guest uh, operator who will be conducting the virus net on the fifth Monday. Tune in and see who that is. All right, Biff. I appreciate that. All right. Thanks, everyone, for being part of our uh, Tark Talks tonight. Have a great evening. Stay safe out there, and we'll talk to you soon.